The truck halts for what seems like the hundredth time in the past hour. Waiting in a troop transport for hours, with the thought of war looming in the distance always made me uneasy. A feeling that is no doubt shared by the rest of my squad, given that only the sounds of military vehicles around us broke the silence. The random topics to be discussed, stupid games to be played by my more rowdy squadmates, and even pre-battle checks and speeches from our squad leader have already been overdone half an hour ago, leaving us all in this state of weird silence and stillness as the convoy continues to move at a snail's pace. The truck moves once again, jerking us all with the sudden movement. As the truck moved a few metres forward, we finally cleared the last of the buildings, which gave us a clear view of the colossal triangular gate at the centre of the compound. The change in view stirs some life to everyone as they turn their gaze towards the gate. The massive structure is one of the five realm gates constructed all over the world after the war. The construct looked rather odd, not what you'd expect portals would look like. It is as if someone cut a thin cross-section out of a metal pyramid, then hollowed out the centre. Nonetheless, it towered over the compound with its grey metallic surface, giving off a slight sheen, adding to its splendour. While the structure itself is a sight to behold, the glassy image of the world beyond is what truly garnered everyone's attention. Some looked in awe at the sight of the mystical realm, as we caught a sight of the alien trees underneath a purple sky. Most of us, however, looked on with burning hatred, for we know of monsters who call that place home. I was only 15 years old when they came. Monsters from so-called greater realms, along with their abominable beasts they call dragons. The elves came first, demanding that we join their dominion, to bend our knees and serve their god-emperor as befitting of creatures from lesser realms. The dwarves came soon after, laying claim to all our resources and technology, calling them as tribute in exchange for protection since we are a weak, dragonless realm. Then the orcs, well, they just wanted to fight and see if we were either slaves or food. They came one after the other, leaving only after giving us their ultimatums. We rejected them all, of course, as calmly and politely as our governments could at the time, but we knew they wouldn't take no for an answer. It was a shocking revelation to us that we weren't the only ones in the universe, but the shock turned into fear and panic after finding out that the others were apparently warmongering fantasy aliens who just so happened to have the means to open a portal to anywhere they wanted. So we did the only thing we could. We braced ourselves for the inevitable war. The elves came first. Their sleek and elegant gates formed all over Central America. Their armies marched out in perfect lockstep, quickly establishing beachheads around their gates before they went on the offensive. Despite our preparations, we still could not have predicted the potency of their first assault. Their dragons would wreak havoc in small, undefended towns before their armies marched in and seized them. Firestorms. Earthquakes and blizzards cast by their dragons made quick work of the local armed forces that were caught off guard by the onslaught of magical spells being thrown at them. Not soon after, as if on cue, the orcs tore through the Iberian Peninsula. Quite literally, as their gates looked more like a tear in the fabric of space than a portal between realms. The orcs were literally physically ripping it wider as they rushed out of the gap. In contrast to the disciplined offensive shown by the elves, the orcs' attack seemed more akin to a mad dash towards war and slaughter. The Portuguese and Spanish countrysides were quickly overwhelmed, while whatever resistance some towns offered was crushed by the orcs' giant drakes. The towering behemoths, some reaching up to four stories tall, easily broke through the lines of police forces, trying to provide cover for the fleeing civilians. The constant stream of news and video feeds showing the brutality of the attacks soon filled the internet. Extreme cruelty and savagery being enacted on humans are laid bare before everyone's eyes. A video of an elf vaporizing a group of surrender civilians. A live feed from a Mexican news helicopter crashing after being hit by a lightning spell. A photo of an eight foot tall orc wearing a necklace of freshly cut human heads. These jarring images felt surreal to me, knowing that the perpetrators have only ever been thought of as fantasy. That is, until the dwarves decided to make it into a reality. 
Approximately 16 hours after the elves invaded Central America, the dwarves arrived. Large sigils formed out of thin air all across Southeast Asia, one directly at the centre of my village. The dwarven rune carved itself into the air, as if an invisible god were writing in some ancient script, burning the skies with each successive stroke. The giant rune hovered above my village. It looked familiar yet ominous, instilling primal fear in those who gazed upon it. Why they chose to attack a small insignificant village, situated on the border between Malaysia and Brunei, is beyond me. All I knew was that we needed to run. And so we ran. We ran as the sky morphed into theirs, the light blue fading into a sickening purple. We ran as the dwarves dropped from the sky, geared in full metal armour carved with more sinister runes. They wasted no time in swinging their hammers and axes at anyone unfortunate enough to be near them. Joining their carnage were stout dragons, whose bare skin glowed in the same glowing runes as their masters. They moved swiftly despite their size, and they hit with the force of a tank as they ploughed through concrete houses. We raced to the border, the one shared between my country and neighbouring Brunei, hoping the guard stationed there could save us. We were right. Soldiers, Malaysians and Bruneians alike came to our rescue. Their guns barked and spit lead at the pursuing dwarves, piercing their enchanted armours and killing them after a couple hits. We continued to flee past the line of soldiers, ducking under the cacophony of gunfire, until we passed the customs building and officially stepped onto Bruneian soil. We took a brief pause, allowing me to gaze back towards the fight, only to see our people slowly getting overrun. The dwarves wisened up and hid behind their dragons for cover, their enchanted hives tanking the barrage of rifle fire, rendering them ineffective. The sudden change in the enemy's tactics prompted the soldiers to slowly retreat, giving ground to the dwarves. A loud bang jolted me back to my senses as I looked back to spot a tank. Looking back, I didn't know what type it was, but now that I'm working in the military, I now know that it was an FV-101 Scorpion, fielded by the Brunei Armed Forces at the time. It was just a light tank, but to me it might as well have been the biggest and meanest tank to have ever existed. It stung a dragon with its main gun dead center, leaving a melon-sized hole straight for his chest. Its coaxical machine gun then shredded the line of dwarves hiding behind the slain dragon. The sight of the beast and the destruction it dished out made the dwarves pause for a second, only for them to continue their march at a more hurried pace. As for our civilians, there was a cue to flee faster. We caught a ride with a fellow countryman seeking asylum among our neighbours, driving us to safety as the battle rages on behind us. We drove for hours. Crossing the entirety of Brunei, to eventually end up back in Malaysia on another border. There we stayed with a distant relative of ours who gave us refuge. That was where we learned of what happened. They were crushed. All of them. Across the world, the interdimensional invaders were repelled as humanity got over the initial shock of their attacks. The elves hadn't even taken over a quarter of Mexico when the United States arrived. Elf armies were turned to ash by precision airstrikes. In one piece of combat footage, a line of elves was strafed by an A-10 warthog, turning their fancy formation into visceral chaos. Dragons fell out of the sky as javelin missiles hunted them mid-air, rendering their magical shields useless against the explosion and the ensuing fireball. Those who had portable AT or AA equipment suddenly found themselves hailed as modern dragon slayers by their fellow soldiers. The orc advance into Spain and Portugal was also stopped as NATO forces took action. Artillery pounded the hordes of orcs that were mindlessly rushing towards fortified human positions. Their lumbering dragons became nothing more than oversized target practice for various military equipment. A video showcasing a leopard tank dueling a 12 meter drake was one prime example. The drake charged towards the tank with unrelenting fury, shattering the ground with each of its strides only for the tank to bear its fangs and fire all its armaments at the stampeding brute. A wave of dust was blasted across the ground as the tank's main cannon roared, hitting the drake's leg with armor-piercing shells. 
The drake howled in pain as it stumbled down, skidding across the remaining distance, only to stop a few meters from the tank. Subsequent shots from the tank's main cannon finished off the beast. In Southeast Asia, the dwarves were on a full retreat as SEA countries mobilized to respond to the attack. The Indonesian military managed to contain a dwarven gate that appeared in Java, while the Philippine Navy blockaded another portal that appeared on an island off the coast of Subic Bay, shooting anything that tried to leave off their cordon. The one in my village was eventually secured by a joint Malaysian and Bruneian force. The ground forces had to seek territory for a while, as dwarven dragons proved to be a huge threat. The flying ones would swoop down and decimate the human lines before quickly flying off, a devastating hit and run tactic. But when FA-18 fighters deployed by the Malaysian Air Force finally arrived, air superiority was quickly achieved. Dogfights between the jets and dragons were a one-sided beatdown that saw dragons plummeting from the sky. Their dragons were fast and agile at flying, but they could never hope to match the jet's speed. With their dragons dead, the dwarves retreated back towards their portal before it closed. The complex lines and symbols in the sky disappeared just as quickly as it had formed. It was a victory for us, but not without losses. Hundreds of thousands of civilian casualties, along with a million more displaced. Towns lay in ruins, be it burned down or crushed into rubble. It was a disaster that was engraved in the hearts and minds of everyone back then. It became the fuel for a desire, one that became the foundation for a plan which saw the combined efforts of the entire human race to achieve. A global effort undertaken over the course of seven years, just for it to come into fruition. It was a desire for revenge. And as the truck's wheels finally step onto the ramp of our own realm gate, I ready myself, for that desire will be sated soon.